All right. Uh, welcome back, everybody who's made it back from lunch. This is the vaulted uh, after lunch session. So uh, please, I, we, we try to get one of the more dynamic speakers. And so I'm happy to welcome to the stage Zach Smith from Packet. Thank you so, so much. So thank you very much. So I guess the uh, after lunch session is almost as exciting as the 7.30 AM session that I attended in San Francisco at Open Core Summit. Not a lot of people going on. So my name is Zachary Smith. Um, where is my thing? Um, I'm the CEO of a company called Packet. I'll tell you a little bit about myself and what we're doing and why we think the movement around multi and hybrid cloud and essentially the escape of ver verticalized ecosystems is so relevant. But I'm going to focus specifically on large enterprise and who I think the main buyer of this product is. Um, so again, about myself, Zachary Smith, uh, born and raised in Southern California, um, decided to come out to New York when I was 17 and go to the Juilliard School to become a classical double bass player. It worked out really good. And <laughs> what I learned at that, ex that experience was that the phrase starving musician is not um, made up. So after I graduated in 2001, <clears throat> I needed a job. Uh, and I found myself working at Credit Suisse at a bank from 6 p.m. to 4 a.m. working on PowerPoints. And it has literally been the bane of my existence. I said that to one of my investors recently, I said, <clears throat> you'll know when I finally made it when I'm not the one having to do my own PowerPoint slides. Um, as of last evening, I'm still doing them. Uh, <laughs> So I was working there at Credit Suisse, and I was thinking, like, what am I going to do? It turns out when you go and work the night shift on PowerPoints, what you're doing is sitting there so that a banker um, can go out drinking with a client and come back and maybe have you do the updates before you know, the 8 AM meeting. Uh, and it turns out that they were more interested in going out drinking in 2001 than they were working on their PowerPoints. So I sat there doing almost nothing. And so I called a friend of mine, and I said, listen, John, I'm looking to start a business, and you're the only guy I know who has started a business. I was a CLEC. Should I get into the telephone business? And he said, absolutely not. Um, but you should get in the recurring revenue business, because if you're a good guy, and you treat people well, and you, bu you build a good product, they might continue to pay you every single month. And so I decided I was going to get into the web hosting business and sell web hosting to my musician classmates at Juilliard. Um, so lo and behold, I go onto webhostingdoc.com, and I post, how do I get a Linux server? And uh, about 2 a.m. in the morning, and somebody writes me back about 2.15 and says, you mean a Linux server? And um, I said, yeah, I need one of those. So he sells it to me, and I start um, doing what I do best, which is sell people on other stuff. And uh, lo and behold, I end up becoming business partners with him and started one of the first cloud computing businesses called Voxel. Um, we didn't know anything, but everybody else knew a little bit less. And so we uh, kind of grew that business and company, uh, sold it in 2011 to a firm called Internap, um, bless their hearts, and um, you know, here we sit today. One of the things that I take away from that, and I think is really important around the, um, the movement that we have going on here, is the aspect on community. In 2001, some of these people were involved in the early days of open source, I'm assuming, with Linux. I think the Red Hat team is up here next. Um, it was a really special place that, that welcomed, frankly, a you know, not very smart musician who didn't know anything about computers, but I could join and start working on it, and people answered my questions. It was, it was a very community-based business. And so I extend that today, uh, not only with what we're doing at Packet, but I'm an avid um, advocate of community-based organizations. I'm on the board of... Uh, really awesome uh, organization in Queens called Pursuit that brings underrepresented uh, uh, ecosystems and, and groups of people, communities, into technology. I'm really proud to say that over the past five years, Juke and his team have helped over 800 people go from $18,000 a year in um, service, food service jobs and related to $85,000 a year by entering our pretty cool technology space. I would ask any of you who operate companies um, to please look for ways that you can involve yourself with organizations like Pursuit and build a pipeline of the next group and candidates of people who can work in our ecosystem, I think you'd be surprised at how, um, how uh, meaningful it can be. I'm also on the board of Open19, which is a hardware foundation built for subscale users, uh, started by Yuval Bukhar from LinkedIn, who ran the infrastructure team there. 
and we're trying to build the ATX case of the rack. How can we make hyperscale innovation available to the next one, two, three, four thousand infrastructure innovators? Okay, that's enough about me. So what we do at Packet is our mission um, is to empower developer-driven enterprises um, with physical infrastructure, and that's without abstraction. So we connect users of software with hardware in a cloud uh, style, meaning consumption-based, repeatable API without layers of abstraction. Um, and our goal is to make infrastructure a competitive advantage for the most interesting companies on the planet. Um, we do that by focusing in on all kinds of different architectures. We support Intel, thank you, AMD, and ARM. Um, we support a massive number of open source projects. If my brother, I have a twin brother, um, identical twin who works at the company, so if I say something wrong, I'll just blame it on him later. Um, but he runs our open source community side, and uh, we're currently sponsoring you know, hundreds of the biggest open source projects to have multi-arch access to builds with different CI companies like Travis and whatnot who bring their ecosystems to us. I'm really happy the Linux kernel um, is built and deployed off of Packet. Most of the operating systems that you all use and leverage off of the CNCF, we provide the infrastructure lab for Kubernetes um, and that ecosystem. And what we do um, is we basically operate, do I have it here? Um, I have it later. Uh, three different products. One is a public cloud, which I'll tell you about. Um, one is a very bespoke infrastructure solution where we take cloud opinion and put it in many places, so we're gonna focus on now. And the other is our software that enables people to have even more opinion within their own four walls. Um, so coming back to the multi-cloud or hybrid cloud movement, does anybody have a preference, by the way? A couple years ago, it was all multi-cloud until people figured out that locking yourself into two clouds was almost bad, or actually doubly as bad as locking yourself into one. Um, so let's go with um, hybrid cloud for now. Where people are really looking for uh, more and more opinion in the software that they are able to run, the choice that they have around technology opinion, but I think that it extends even further. And I'm gonna focus on a large scale enterprise buyer. Um, who here uh, works for what I would call a big enterprise? Like 25,000 people or something or more. Yeah. Um, in my world, it was always a big enterprise with like 1,000 people, and then I looked it up on Gardner, and it was like, actually, that's a small enterprise. <laughs> and so big enterprises, the one thing I, I know is that they have a lot of opinion. And so what I um, focus on in this talk is around what I call the five Ps of infrastructure opinion with large enterprises and why I think we're seeing such a movement towards this world of portable software. It's not because people are so challenged on this or that or that feature. It's that they have just more opinion than a verticalized stack within infrastructure, data centers, capital, software, network, the whole thing could be provided by a verticalized cloud model. So I think we're getting into effectively the opinion game. So I'm gonna go through my five Ps, talk a little bit about how we address that, and then take any questions that we may have. All right, so enterprises, you guys know you work at them, they're probably super simple, the onboarding process is easy, the departmental meetings are no problem, your Outlook calendar is usually free. Um, but reality, you know, go into the world of technology within a large enterprise, and you've got a lot of everything. This isn't the hyperscale world of homogenous, perfect, you know, software running to do one app. It's like, I went to a bank recently and I asked them how many production applications they said, and they think they had 5,000 different production applications, right? So the complexity of the enterprise is real, and I think ignoring it and trying to present this kind of homogenous viewpoint of you know, a hyperscale world is, is actually um, a little bit backwards. So the first thing that I always focus on with enterprises is price. And analogy I was giving earlier over lunch was that if you look at a public cloud model today where infrastructure is a commodity and software is what you buy, um, I think that <clears throat> you've really got what I like to call a retail banking product. You've got a pretty normal thing that works for 80, 90, 95% of the world who is going to use technology is probably completely fine in a public cloud environment, maybe even just one public cloud environment. Um, in fact, you might be so generic that you're way up in some PaaS platform that you don't really care where you sit. But for the large enterprise, let's just boil that down to the top few thousand enterprises in the world, you're probably spending somewhere between a billion and 10 billion a year on technology. 
I think most of the banks are in that five to eight billion dollar range. I think most of the telecoms are pretty much in that range. I think the, the car companies are pretty much in that range. You're spending a lot of money, so price kind of matters, right? And so I think one of the issues that we're dealing with in cloud, certainly um, in uh, technology in general, is cost, right? It's really expensive to pay software margins for infrastructure and then have little choice because of the amount that you develop and integrate into those platforms. So I put a quote up here for every one of my P's and a little funny GIF. People were supposed to laugh. You don't have to. But basically, price is one of the P's that we always think about. How are we going to solve the pricing equation? It doesn't always have to be with low cost. It just might be where's the value or how are you going to use the right tool for the job um, to reach that. And this is really important because software um, and this is probably a great uh, uh, slide for most of this audience. Um, it's really, I think we didn't paste it in the right resolution. But um, this is from Battery Ventures Cloud New York Conference. Uh, they give this every year. It's called the State of Software. And if you could read it appropriately, you'd see that that little line over there called today is 2018 or 19. I think this is last year's. And what we do is we grow software at the rate of inflation. And if you zoom out, you know, 10 to 15 years, the curve gets really big. And so the question I think we have is like, the software world going to grow faster than the rate of inflation or slower? I think probably faster is a good, um, you know, bet. So if that's the case, what infrastructure you run that on, what cloud you might be using is like really critical. Um, not only the software you create or buy, but where you run it. And I think that cost, especially as we focus on large enterprise, is gonna be a critical component of the pie. And it's hard. Most organizations are not even optimizing for costs. I think if anybody here uses a cloud and has a developer ecosystem, developers love to use stuff and hate to give it back. They are no different from IT buyers. That's why we put all the walls and barriers in IT. You need a PO before I'm going to go buy those servers. Well, now we get to move fast with DevOps, so people don't need that PO. They just get to you know, have it, and then you're supposed to take it away somehow. So I think human behavior is going to be a really big portion of this about how we come up with not only technology matters like for software to control and incentivize um, and price, but also to use the right part of your budget. And one of our customers who did this, um, Platform 9, I don't know if you guys know them, but they're a hybrid cloud platform providing this to medium and large size enterprises. And they moved to us from AWS uh, a couple of years ago, I guess in the past two years, specifically because they're, they're cogs. And you can see some S1 filings recently um, for public companies, SaaS companies is all the rage to go public. I'm sure the investors in the room are very pleased. But you know, their biggest COGS item is almost always infrastructure. So data-heavy businesses um, or compute-heavy businesses, the public cloud is a huge cost driver. So being able to have that cost savings in your infrastructure, I think, is going to be a critical component for enterprises. The second one is proximity. Um, anybody following the super clear edge computing space these days? Yeah. Um, so the way I describe edge computing um, packets often lumped in, I sit on a lot of panels where people ask me what the killer app for the edge is and why five milliseconds of latency matters versus 10 and how much people are willing to pay for it. Um, and I just basically boil this down to a P, which is proximity. Proximity matters to enterprises for various reasons. Um, part of those are technology based, which is, okay, we've got a lot of data. Um, there's there's actually no public cloud sitting in New York City. Um, there's not even any public cloud availability zones sitting in New York Metro. Why? Because the power is expensive and the space is expensive, et cetera, right? Um, but it doesn't mean that people don't have applications that are generating huge amounts of data needing location, whether for backhaul or pure latency reasons to be here. Um, but I really just think that this is the edge is about hybrid cloud. This is like the point of this conference, which is people want to run the workload they want where they want to run their workload. Some people have a ton of opinion about that workload and other people don't care. Um, and so one of the examples I give here is a customer of ours called Sprint. Um, I never thought in a million years that I would say Sprint is a cool company. But we have been so impressed working with them. We build their Curiosity IoT infrastructure, which is their enterprise B2B, or as Evo Rook over there says, B2D, business to developer or business to di disruptor segment. And what they do is they basically, instead of going to enterprises and saying, here is this big iPhone network that I built at the lowest cost possible per handset, would you like to buy a slice of it for your IoT? 
They turn it around and they say, hey, I would like to build you a wireless network. Where do you want it? And that doesn't matter for most people, but if you're a large enterprise, like maybe a big car company or a logistics company or a big warehousing business, actually location matters. Uh, you need to have it only there, and you don't want to pay for the rest of the Midwest along with it. You just want there. Um, and so I think location matters a lot in this case. Sprint comes to Packet and says, I would like you to build a four-rack availability zone in Greenville, North Carolina, and I'd like it within 90 days. And that's what we do for them. Why? Because they have a radio network and a customer who's telling them to be in Greenville. And so I think that location and proximity is, is, is pretty different depending upon the customer. We have another customer called Section who, they don't care about being in Greenville. They just want to be everywhere. And what does everywhere mean? Everywhere as reasonably economically possible. <laughs> they operate a software-based CDN. They are not an infrastructure player, so they don't have a 10 or 15 or 20 year legacy of building infrastructure like, say, Akamai, but they're offering a uh, application delivery platform for modern apps. They would like to be as close as is reasonable possible. So they deploy with us in every single site that we have, including Greenville, okay? So I think location can mean either please get me everywhere for these jurisdictional reasons or performance or whatnot, or please just get me to that one location. And we have performance. Um, so I think that we all kind of recognize that performance is better, right? But it's all an economic reason or it's related to that previous slide about what my budget is or anything else like that. But I think the vast majority of companies moving on a you know, multi-cloud or hybrid strategy are doing so in part because of performance. Um, and that can mean um, two different things. I think you've got performance in network, you've got performance in the actual you know, compute, maybe you've got performance of the uh, backhaul, the right kind of offloading. There's like so many ways to get to performance where you're going to put your money, time, and energy. Um, but I think the need for increased performance, especially when more and more of these large enterprises are competing against hyperscale players that are really good at performance. So I don't know if anybody here operates like an e-commerce site, but um, you know, Google search, we just kind of take it like for granted uh, that it's really fast and returns pretty instant results. One of our customers and you know, good friend, uh, the team that runs Algolia, you know, is now having to provide that and growing amazing. I think they just raised $120 million yesterday to continue building search as a service because now everybody ex expects instant search. Actually, it's really hard. And so I think that you can see the bar being raised for performance to enterprises um, because of these you know, huge advancements that hyperscalers have made or, or large internet companies have made in their own platforms. So you know, a highlighted customer of ours, OneSignal, which does push messaging, and for them, it was really simple. They didn't go into 100 locations like Algolia does. What they needed was the right hardware. And they called us up, and they basically said, you mean I can have a cloud API, but you can give me this very specific NVMe product? And we're like, yeah, we can. And um, you know, it changed their database product. So and I think performance is, again, really personal. Everything is different and customized. With large enterprises, they're not one. But I think that you, know, you got to look at these P's as being pretty unique. This is the fun one. Anybody watch the debate last night? Not me, but I heard Bernie is still with it. Um, let's just hope that none of them talk about the internet infrastructure or hybrid cloud. Um, so politics, let's bring up a good Boris. Um, I think that this is one of the most interesting things to me that affects large enterprises that the vast majority of developers or software companies or actually businesses in the whole don't really care about. But if you are a large enterprise buyer, you have to care about politics. And this whole concept that 83% you know, of engineers, infrastructure engineers believes that the software will move between clouds, okay, like they need it to move between clouds. They need it to be able to go wherever some crazy politician tells them it has to go. And so I think the interesting thing about politics is not rational. You can't predict it. You can't negotiate on it. You can't be like, oh, I'm not really this year, maybe next year. You know, if you're a, a bank and you're financially regulated and they change the law and say, nope, all your data has to be here so my regulator can see it, touch it, look at it. You gonna say no? No, you're gonna figure it out. And so I think it's one of the most important trends we have within the hybrid cloud or multi-cloud ecosystem is that it's hitting enterprises, and enterprises don't have the luxury of putting the you know, wax in their ears and saying, there's no availability zone in Indonesia, so I guess I won't comply with the local law. Um, that's not possible for them. They're subject to it. They operate there, or they might. 
So politics to me is, you know, one of the biggest P's, and we focus on that flexibility a lot. And the last one, and we'll, t we'll kind of stop talking about all the P's for enterprises and talk about some solutions, is pride. And if you've worked with in big companies or even small, we have pride in what we do. Why? Because, you know, that's what we do. Or maybe this is what we always done, or because we're really good at that. And so I think that we can't forget that people like to have, or large companies like to have ownership. Um, so they might have a particular pride. Thing is like, well, you know what? We're founded in Vermont, and we're going to run our cloud in Vermont. And, you know, we really are like with the Vermont. My brother lives in Vermont. That's why I'm picking on it. Um, but, you know, like, go Vermont, right? That might be a thing, and um, we need to be cognizant for large enterprise. Not everybody, but people with the money, budget, and capability, you know, should be able to meet that. So there are things within, you know, large enterprise buyers that says, you know, I didn't build it, so we're not going to use it, or, you know, maybe we're going to do it in-house, or maybe I went to college with the guy who sells me HP servers, so I really love to buy HP servers, and, you know, these types of things are part of the scenario of selling to large enterprise. I think the bottom line is that having infrastructure choice and software freedom above it creates the capability to have a much more diverse answer towards selling to large enterprise. And again, coming back to my previous point, and we'll get into kind of our solution, is that the vast majority, I believe, of companies in the world are not gonna care about almost all of this. Retail banking and Chase checking accounts, free toasters, low fees, minimum balance of $15 is fine for almost everybody in the cloud. But if you're the billionaire and the big spender and your business is built on that, you're going to have all these different P's to, let, to some degrees, and you're, you're going to want to have it your way. So what does Packet do? We try and bring that workload automation, that consistent API and access to the thing you want in the place you want, when you want it, without making it suck. And I know that's like not a perfect marketing tool, but you know, what we basically try and do is make accessing physical infrastructure and having those P's, the price, proximity, performance, you know, meeting your political needs or you know, fulfilling your pride dreams, um, we try and make that really awesome for the world of software. And so what we do is we sell three different things. One is a public cloud. You can go on to packet.com and consume bare metal infrastructure with no layers of abstraction, layer three networks with your own IP space or mine, and we'll let you turn it on and run whatever software you want. In fact, the last time I was on this stage was three or four years ago at Tectonic Summit, which might be one of the things that started Tectonic Summit, um, this whole you know, multi-cloud world or hybrid cloud world. Um, and you know, I remember working with Alex because he was one of the first users of our platform, and he was building CoreOS. And he was like, I need an automated API for doing continuous integration on an operating system, which means I don't want to have another operating system on there. And so giving access to physical hardware and doing so in a safe and consistent way is what our public cloud allows the developer ecosystem to access. But the vast majority of our customers buy our custom cloud product, where we partner with real estate companies, data center businesses, tower companies, commercial real estate, and we allow you to have cloud anywhere. If you want somebody else to help you operate it, but you want to have an opinion on what it is and where it is, we will build and operate for you private availability zones. That's what we do for Sprint. Um, and then on-premise, where we basically give our software what we use to run our cloud. And that means resource control, tenant management, hardware asset management, data center control, all the kind of boring stuff I'm gonna say of the plumbers of the internet to make computers turn on and off reliably with the ecosystems you care about. And what that's done for us is this is my layer cake we think that there's a really well-formed ecosystem around data centers. Anybody here buy data center space or whatnot? Yeah. You don't have to build a data center anymore to have access to a data center. It's pretty cool. Um, you can go to Equinix, you can go to DRT, you can go to all these other places, and you don't have to build and operate your own enterprise data center, but you can have it that way. Um, you can also go to the next layer, which is generally considered infrastructure as a service. And can anybody tell me, like, where does infrastructure as a service start and stop? Right now, to me, it's everywhere from bare metal hardware to virtualization to security groups to networking to load balancing to object storage. I mean, like infrastructure as a service is like almost all of it. And I think what we're finding out right now is that there's this diverse array of software sitting up top, which is your, your opinion, your application, your runtime, your IIS stack, which might just be VMware, by the way, or it might be you know Kubernetes sitting on top of bare metal. It doesn't matter. It's just software. There's a new model, we think this is the important layer cake for Packet to do, which is hardware as a service, where we're doing the 
kind of mucky, mucky stuff of hardware delivery, provisioning, lifecycle management, maintenance, security, fundamental kind of problems there. And so we're really excited by the movement that's been happening over the past few years that is bringing all this diversity and workload. And, and frankly, a lot of this has to do with the software world basically just eating its way down and making its product more and more portable. I think 2020 is going to be super exciting to see the workload that's going to happen between hybrid cloud. We're going to see this become, I think, almost an afterthought, which is that, of course, you're going to be able to move your fundamental platform wherever you want to and need to. We'll kind of laugh at ourselves that we thought cloud in 2015 was all going to be run by Amazon or all going to be run by Microsoft in this one way because software is going to get really good, and that's what people want to buy. They want to buy software outcomes. And the question is, is can we as an industry create an infrastructure layer that isn't awful, that you can have where you want it when you want it at a really great price? So this is uh, where we fit. I think that's all. I finished with a minute or two early, but if there's any questions, I'd love to take them, and if not, I will give you your coffee break. All right, thanks so much.